Good afternoon. Welcome back to Storytime. Glad you could all join us. Little Miss Everly after was here. She was telling me it's time for Storytime. She's gotten used to the routine, so around 3.45 every day she starts barking and saying, hey, it's time to have Storytime. Let's hang out. So we continue today our story, Too Much Salt and Pepper by Sam Campbell. We are in Chapter 14 of Porky and a Young Punk, Finding the Source of Faith and Strength. The north wind was still strong, though the rain was over. Little island-like clouds drifted through the azure sky, and the ruffled lake waters sprinkled in the morning sun, sparkled in the morning sun, as if some spirit were sowing seeds of diamonds. It was a little difficult to be very cheerful at breakfast at the breakfast table this morning of Carol's last full day at the sanctuary. Jokes were pointless and smiles a bit forced. Carol sat looking distantly out the window while her food grew cold. And I had a story to tell, which only added to her regrets. During the night, I had heard something breaking through the brush on the island. Careful not to awaken the others, I had slipped out, flashing, flashlight in hand, and discovered a good-sized bear still dripping wet from his swim. He was moving with obvious purpose. The island was only a resting place in a longer journey. There was no time to call Jenny and Carol, for when I discovered the creature, he was at the point of leaving the island. As he realized he was discovered, he emitted the bear's typical whoosh and ran toward the water, snapping off a good-sized young tree that happened to be in his path. I could see his great black head plainly as he swam away, and long after he had disappeared into the darkness. I heard his huge paws occasionally break the water. Carol was ready to feel sorry for herself anyway that morning, and this story of the bear gave her the opportunity. It was bad enough, she thought, that she had to go home the next morning without missing her only chance to see a bear. We walked around the island and found the animal's tracks. It was easy to see where he was when he first caught wind of me, for his claws had dug in deeply as he sprang forward. His tracks were plain where he had gone down the bank into the water. And Carol looked long in the direction he had gone, as if hoping he might be stuck on a wave and held there. She looked with amazement at the splintered tree the animal had broken off in his flight. You would have seen enough of bears if you had been here when Bunny Hunch and Big Boy came, I remarked, recalling with a shake of my head our experience with two pet cubs. Speaking of nuisances, they made Inky and Salt look like angels. Many years had passed since those two bears had been at the sanctuary. Still, the region around wore scratches and scars left by their dynamic activity. Under a tree stood the two crates in which the animals had been shipped to us. The wood was decaying and the heavy wire rusting, but Carol could still see the marks of bear claws and teeth in the heavy boards. Babies, though these creatures were at the time, they were already displaying the amazing strength of their kind. Carol listened to the story of those famous cubs and became almost as excited as if she were seeing them herself. Never would we forget the day the bears arrived. Jenny had not yet become Mrs. Campbell, and my fine friend Bobby was with me at the sanctuary at the time. Even now in his letters written from far-off military camps, he speaks often of this experience. We were expecting the bears, for we had agreed to accept them and liberate them in the forest. The two orphan cubs had been raised by con a conservation warden. It was thought that it was time to turn them loose, so that they might make their own way in the world. As they were not in the least frightened by human beings, it would have been unfair to liberate them in hunting territory. Therefore, the plan was to let them live under the protection of our sanctuary. Remember the fabled Pandora's box, which, when opened, liberated evils in the world? Well, it was much the same when we opened the two crates in which those 60-pound cubs arrived. Bobby said he was sure the whole sanctuary cringed a little when the two creatures climbed out, shook themselves, and started looking around to see where to start their mischief. The first cub to emerge was whining a little and acting babyish. We tried to call her Honey Bunch, but stuttered a little in our excitement and said Bunny Hunch, and she was Bunny Hunch from then on. The next bear was plainly larger. Hi there, big boy, Bobby called in greeting, and so the team of Bunny Hunch and Big Boy was named. The bears had, a long, had had a long train ride and were hungry. We prepared a bite of lunch totaling, before they were through, with half a dozen helpings, eight loaves of bread, and six quarts of milk. After this dainty repast, they began a survey of their new surroundings. They were a six-ring circus all rolled up in two black hides. 
Obviously, they were happy in their new surroundings. Until now, they had known only a fenced-in pen with a single tree in it. Now, here were hundreds of trees. Old logs to pot of pieces, bushes, plants, lily pads, lakes. We could almost hear them yell, whoopee, as they raced about in their new paradise. They tumbled about like two overgrown puppies, bit and cuffed each other around, tipped over our woodpile, and paused long enough to pull several boards off their crates just to make sure they wouldn't be put in those things again. Now we had better train them right from the beginning, Bobby said, though his ambition in this direction was greater than his ability. We might as, have, we might as well have tried to train an earthquake. For the first few hours, we didn't know for sure whether it was day or night. All we knew was we had two bear cubs on our hands. Every few minutes, either Bobby or I was seeking the other to exclaim excitedly, Do you know what they have done now? And then there would be an account of some new depredation they had committed. We had just done the washing, and it was hanging out to dry. Right before our eyes, those cubs broke down the line and went racing away in the highest glee, dragging clean clothes all through the brush and over the dirt. We found the line later, far down the shoreline, dirtier than it had ever been before washing. After they had been quiet for a while, we looked out on the lake to find all our boats adrift. The ropes by which they had been tied had been chewed in two by the bears, and how they loved to play with us, unfortunately. They would race at us, rise on their hind legs, and plant their front feet forcibly in our midships. Often this happened when we were not prepared, and Bobby and I took many a sudden seat on the ground. After the first few hectic hours, their excitement abated somewhat, and they settled down to a bit milder living. But we had to, maintain, we had to remain on the alert. We never knew what was going to happen next. Certainly, their table manners could have been improved. They ate anything, and lots of it. When mealtime came, they knew it, and sat watching our back door like two black bombs all ready to explode. When we would emerge with a kettle of food, looking like enough to feed a regiment, they would make a run at us and make us feel like a, the man who catches the kickoff in a football game. Bears are related to pigs, and their family ties are most obvious. They seem to try to climb right in that kettle, both of them at once. There would be a battle that sounded as if they intended to tear each other to pieces, and we, with never a please or thank you to pay us for our trouble, would usually be sitting helplessly on the ground, sometimes with the food spilled all over us and the bears gathering it up with their tongues. Then we learned a little trick. We would open and shut the back door several times to attract their attention. As they watched that door ominously, we would slip out the front door and have their food all placed out in separate pans before they discovered us. But eventually they learned the trick. When we slammed the back door as a decoy, they would race to the front door. When we altered our strategy and tried to come out the back door, one of them stayed at each place. We couldn't win. There wasn't the usual compensation with these animals. Salt, inky, pepper, rack, and ruin had all given us the joy of petting them. They liked to be cuddled. Not so with these bears. One, only one quieting touch of intimacy did we experience with them. They would stand still while we scratched back of their ears. It seemed to be the spot on their bodies they couldn't scratch themselves, and they accepted our help. But patting or petting, it didn't mean a thing to them. Their pesky hides are so thick, no ordinary sensation gets through. They are amusing, though, and in spite of our troubles, Bobby and I were nearly sick from laughter. One day, when Bobby made a trip to the village for supplies, he brought back some highly colored toy balloons. The cubs had never seen anything like them, and the big babies were frightened to their wit's end. Bobby first let the balloons drift from the back porch to the ground near where the bears were lying, sunning themselves. They took one look at these strange objects and with wild snorts raced away into the woods, kicking huge clods of dirt into the air as they went. It was so sudden, so unexpected, and struck us as being so funny that Bobby and I doubled up with that kind of laughter which won't come out. Tears came to our eyes and we leaned against each other to keep from falling. But there was more excitement to come. The bears were returning, out of the brush, a step at a time, eyes focused nervously on the balloons, which were rolling lightly about on the ground. On they came with hesitant steps, as, and many an inquisitive sniff and threatening growl. Were not they, the bears, kings of the forest? Did not every living creature stand back when they came near? What were these funny-looking, puffed-up, colored creatures that dared drift right up to their noses without fear? They approached stiff-legged and tense, as if entering the battle of their lives. The balloons calmly rolled about. At last, the bears were within reach of the balloons. Simultaneously, each raised a great paw and struck a blow that would have crumbled a rock. Pop went one balloon, pop went another, and away went the bears faster than before, kicking clods of dirt high in the air and breaking down every bush that appeared in their paths. 
Bobby and I leaned against, against each other again, our faces spread in ghastly grins, tears coursing down our cheeks, but not a sound of laughter coming out. The bears repeated the stunt time and again until we couldn't stand it anymore. We went in the cabin and sat there until we could really laugh it out. Bunny Hunch and Big Boy never did overcome their fear of those balloons. Probably it was a mystery that impressed them. What could a fellow do when he was facing some sort of creature that just disappeared when he slapped it? One day, when the bears were swimming across swimming, came a most amusing episode of these balloon experiences. We saw them playing about in the water, and thinking something unusual might happen, we went upwind from them and released several balloons on the water. The light little things drifted rapidly toward the bears. Suddenly, the animals discovered them. They actually screamed. Lunging forward with all their power, they went swimming frantically downwind. The balloons, of course, followed them. It was almost too much, and those bears swam as never their kind swam before. They left a wake behind them, like that from a launch. Finally, re they reached a distant shore and raced, puffing and half-exhausted, back into the woods. It was late in the day when they returned, and for once they were quiet. Bobby and I were quiet, too, for we had laughed until we were as exhausted as they. Bobby and I kept up our courage and patience through those summer months with one hope. If we could keep those bears from utterly destroying the sanctuary, and perhaps ourselves before winter, they would enter hibernation. Probably by spring they would have forgotten us to some extent and take to life in the forest. But it was a long time until winter, and there was many a problem to come. Nothing was safe or sacred with those bears. They pulled down or pushed over everything that would move, and scratched or bit everything that wouldn't. When the autumn rains set in, we were greeted with a surprise that was far from pleasant. Water started streaming through the roof. An inspection revealed the fact that our pets had been on the cabin roof and pulled off the roofing paper. While we were looking over this calamity and deciding how to fix it, we carelessly left a ladder leaning against the house. Big Boy promptly climbed up on it and poked his paw through a window. They took to sleeping under the cabin, and sometimes in the middle of the night we would be awakened by the wildest snarling and growling as they scuffled with each other. The vocalizations of bears are far from lullabies. We were happy to see them begin to get sluggish and sleepy as the first cold days came. Surely they were going into hibernation. When we left to give lectures in distant cities, we felt that our problem with Bunny Hunch and Big Boy was at an end. We were entirely too optimistic. Shortly after Christmas time, word reached us that a forester had visited our cabin and the bears were wandering around looking sleepy, but not asleep. This would not do. If they were up and using the energy of moving about, they had to have food. When a bear hibernates, all bodily activity is reduced to a minimum so that he can live by absorbing the layers of fat he has stored for the purpose. But if our pets were not sleeping, they needed help. Back we went to the north woods, and with sleds and snowshoes, we reached the sanctuary with a load of food and bales of straw. Bunny Hunch and Big Boy were there all right, walking about as if in a stupor. They took our food, accepted the straw beds we prepared for them, and once more we felt that they were ready to sleep for the winter. The bears got through the winter all right, but in the spring they did not take to the wildwood as we had hoped. This sanctuary was a right good boarding house, and they had no intention of leaving it. Besides, they had become accustomed to human companionship. People were part of their lives, and they did not forget this as we hoped they would. And it was this fact that led to our next and most embarrassing adventure. Bobby and I were somewhat delayed in returning to the sanctuary that following spring. My neighbor, the same one whom Salt chose to annoy, arrived at his cabin first. Bunny Hunch and Big Boy were awake and wandering about our grounds, probably wondering where those human beings could be. One day there was a pounding at my neighbor's cabin. As he and a hired man began taking down storm windows and opening doors, the bears recognized those sounds as the kind that human beings make, and they went to investigate. They were good-sized bears by this time, and the quarter-mile swim to our neighbor's home meant nothing to them. But imagine the surprise the men experienced when they heard splashing in the water near their pier and looked down to see two bears emerging and running toward them. Not knowing that they were friendly bears, the men ran too. That, that was wonderful, the bunny hunch and big boy. Not only were human beings coming back, but these men had not forgotten how to play. After the men they went, the chase leading around and around the house, the men believing they were running for their lives, the bears having a hilarious time. Finally, the men ran into the boathouse and slammed the door shut, where they stood puffing, their hearts beating hard, after what they believed was a narrow escape from disaster. The bears looked over the situation a bit. 
They had seen boathouses before and knew that there were generally two ways to get into them, one through a door on the land side and the other through another larger entrance on the lake side. They tried the latter way and it was open. Splashing and snorting, the bears came swimming in one door and the men went running out the other. Now the men climbed into a boat in supposed desperation and pushed out from shore. But when they started to row, they found they only had one oar. In the meantime, the bears were po poised on the shore watching them. Thinking this was a part of some new kind of play, they plunged into the water and headed for the boat. It is improbable that one oar has ever propelled a boat faster than happened down that day. The water fairly churned. Fortunately, there was an outboard motor on the boat, and my neighbor succeeded in getting it started. He said the sound of that engine was the sweetest music he had ever heard. As the boat skimmed away, the bears followed a while and then disappeared into the woods, the men singing hymns of gratitude. This was the story which greeted us when we arrived at the sanctuary a few days after our neighbor's exciting adventure. We knew what it meant. We could not have bears and neighbors at the same time. Bunny Hunch and Big Boy then were caught in big boxes and taken away. She went to a park further in the North Woods where she has good care and other bears for companions. He was taken to the state game farm many miles to the south. Big Boy's ride was an epic. He was fairly contented with his box until it was loaded on the trailer and the journey began. Then he decided to break out. He clawed and chewed thick boards to slivers. The men who had him in charge kept nailing new boards on the outside of the crate until he ripped them off on the inside. All the way down the highway this contest continued and the men arrived at the game farm with their troublesome charge just as their stock of boards and nails was exhausted. Big Boy walked out of his crate calmly as if nothing had happened and contentedly took up life in his new home. Are bears the strongest animals in the world? asked Carol as the story was finished. Her eyes were dancing and her face flushed with merriment. That is a difficult question to answer, Carol, I said. In nature, strength is quite a different thing from what we human beings think it. No doubt the bear can vanquish in combat any other creature in the North American woods, but that is no honest measure of strength. Each creature in nature seems to have the kind of strength and the amount of it needed for his way of living. Proportionally, the bear performs no such feats as the ant, which will lift loads many times its own weight. He will hardly equal the doings of a delicate butterfly, which will flap its frail wings the width of an ocean. There is a power in the things of creation which cannot be measured in terms of muscle and sinew. What is the force which lifts rivers of sap from the roots of trees to the outermost twigs and leaves? What is the power of growth which leads a mushroom to thrust its frail head through the crusted soil, pushing aside stones or sticks as it goes? What enables the roots of plants to thread themselves through cracks in solid rocks and finally break them in pieces? It fits well with our thought for today that we should look into this power of life and growth, I said. Suppose we go into the old forest fire area. There is something there I want to show you. Jenny, Carol, and I paddled our canoe to a point on the lake shore where once had raged a forest fire. Here had stood a marvelous forest of hemlock and pine. In the early days at the sanctuary, we had roamed much in these forest halls. The peace of the ages rested in them. The forest floor beneath the great trees was carpeted thickly with pine needles, softening the footfall of all visiting creatures. This was the forest primeval. Then came fire, which is the forest's prime evil. Some was, someone was careless and burned some brush when a high wind was blowing. Sparks flew far and wide, and before the fire had burned itself out, many miles of beautiful woods lay in smoldering ruin. Everything seemed destroyed. For years following, the area showed only blackened stumps, a monument to human carelessness. And yet there was one thing that was not destroyed, and that is the principle of growth. That marvelous power which made these woods grow in the beginning would make them grow again. The seed was not lost. Right among the decaying stumps of that old-time forest, new trees began coming up. There were balsams, pines, hemlocks, hundreds and thousands of them. They cracked the surface soil, nosed their way through matted leaves and old logs, up through grasses and ferns, up toward the sunlight which was calling them. Human ignorance had presented the forest with a problem, but the trees were equal to it because the power of growth comes from the source that is never defeated and never exhausted. And Carol, said I, as we stood among those young virile trees, marveling at the power displayed before us, it is the same with men and nations. The glorious power which results in good character is never defeated. That which, in our better moments, makes us rise to the grandeur of rendering service, love, friendship, self-sacrifice, and the doing of good works, that cannot be destroyed. 
There are forest fires of a sort that sweep through our society, wars, epidemics, and of selfishness and sensualism. Sometimes it seems that our best institutions lie in smoldering ruins like the burning stumps of this forest. But just as these trees rise again through that power we cannot see and cannot stop, so our own civilization lives and rises again, lifted by irresistible spiritual force. Do you see more clearly what is the real strength and force we find in nature? It is not in what we see as much as it is back of all that exists. Carol nodded, but she was too deep in thought for the moment to speak. We walked in silence through the avenues of young trees, touching those nearest us as if we were petting them. Do you mind if I talk this out with Inky this evening, Carol asked with a little smile? You mean go to him alone? Yes, please. I won't get lost, I promise. And that evening, Carol went alone to the mainland and down the short trail to the salt lick. Jenny and I were much pleased that she wanted to do so. It meant that she had learned to love solitude and that fear of darkness and silence was no part of her. She was gone a long time, so long we had walked down to our pier and watched toward the mainland. Presently we saw her flashlight back among the trees as she came down to her boat. Did you find Inky? We asked as she landed on the island. Yes, I did. And did he talk to you? Jenny and I laughed, but Carol did not. It was silly of me ever to think he couldn't, she said. She was ashore now, and we three stood looking at the dark mansion where Inky lived. He looked so quiet and wise, Carol went on, as if he had inside information on everything. And while I sat looking at him, I believe I was more quiet than I have ever been before. When I learned your secret, then I learned your secret. Inky talks with silence instead of sound. He speaks in your thoughts. Tonight he spoke in mine. At least I thought he did. Carol, Carol, I guess you have learned my secret, I said, laughing delightedly. Now what do you think he said? Carol had found old Inky in a very candid mood. Sometimes he was almost rude. It was the first time he had seen her alone, and he wasn't quite sure of her. He came near, then ran away. A few minutes later, he returned again and stood looking inquisitively at her. She tried to pet him, but he raised his quills and acted tough. Finally, he gained confidence and crawled into her lap, where he sat in his characteristic silence. Carol stroked Inky's head and fed him a few bites of cookie. She was thinking of the things she had learned that day. Some right good ideas you got there, considering you're just a young punk, said Inky, according to Carol. But I wonder if you're smart enough to catch the real point. What do you mean, Inky? Carol had asked. Well, you noticed how strength comes to things in nature. That's all and well and good. Did you ever watch me climb a tree or bite through a stick? It takes a lot of pep to do that, and I know just how to do it. I have to have faith in that source of all power. I have to know that I am taken care of by something that is bigger than I am. But, ah, balsam juice, a young punk can't understand things like that. Yes, I can, Inky, Carol had insisted. I know what you mean. Please go on. Well, I'll try, said Inky skeptically. It may be a waste of my good Northwood's breath, but I'll try. Did you ever hear or read a lesson something about looking at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field? Yes, I know that lesson, said Carol, and I like it. Yes, but you didn't really learn it, snapped Inky, chattering his teeth a bit. Not many of you folks do learn that. You remember that lesson says to look at those lilies and birds and see how swell they get along in the world. It points out how well they are taken care of, much better than the rich and famous fellows you folks often write about. But the lesson goes on. It says you human beings are even better than they are. Sometimes I think that goes a little too far. I don't see so much that's superior in you people, but never mind that. The lesson says that your Heavenly Father is taking care of you, giving you strength and everything you need. And then what does it call you? Carol was silent, trying to think out the answer. There, said Inky, there you are. That's just what I thought. You heard the lesson lots of times, and the most important part you don't know. You're mighty glad to have it tell you you are better than other creatures. That kind of pats you on the back, and you like to be flattered and you like the promise of that, of that great power back of all things taking care of you. That's all okay, but you don't, don't like what the lesson tells you about what to do, and what calls you. You tell me, Inky, said Carol, now very humble. Well, by balsam juice, it tells you to quit thinking of yourself, to quit being all concerned about what is going to happen tomorrow, how you're going to get clothes to wear and things to eat, because the same thing that makes a tree grow, a flower bloom, a bird fly, and us porkies bosses of the world, Inky paused a moment and straightened out his quills, giving a quiet little ahem. That same thing is looking after you. And then, now listen to this, young punk, and then it calls you ye of little faith. 
there's the thing you gotta face, and it isn't very complimentary. All these fine things done for you, and still you don't have much faith in the one who has done them. That's why you don't get all the help and blessings that are naturally yours. You don't have faith in the Creator caring for His creation. At least not many of you do. Sometimes there is one of you that's smart enough to have this faith and quit his worrying about all the fake strength folks invent with their imaginations. And when someone does that, he goes places. Your leaders, writers, thinkers, all your great men, they learned this lesson and held on to it. And why the rest of you go on scrapping, doubting, forgiving, forgetting the things you know is more than I can see. Why hang it all on a cedar tree? Faith is all you need to bring out all the strength and power God gave you. Faith kind of plugs you in on universal current. It's the way you hitch yourself up to all the strength you need. If you know what I mean, and I bet you don't. But I do know what you mean, Inky Carroll said. I learned something about that when I was lost in the woods. Okay then, young punk, Inky said with a challenge, but it's how you live, not what you say, that counts. Come back in a year and let me see how you got along, then I'll know if you were smart or not. If you've learned how to work hard and have a good time of doing it, if you've learned to treat people decently, whether they do much for you or not, and if you've learned that faith in the one that you folks call your Heavenly Father gives you the strength to do things, mind you now, I don't say it does things for you, it makes you do them yourself, then I'll believe in you. But until you prove these things, you're just a young punk. Out of my way now. I got a lot of chewing to do tonight. And Inky waddled away unceremoniously, leaving Carol alone with a lot to think about and to do. Carol, I said as her account was finished, Inky never spoke in my thoughts any better than he has spoken in yours. I hope you enjoyed our story this afternoon. Join us again tomorrow, 4 o'clock, same time, same place, for chapter 15, our last chapter, Farewell with a Future to It. Good afternoon and God bless.